You may have seen me using this white poster putty to stick contact mics to things. And the three questions that I get asked about that are, first of all, what is it? And that's easy to answer. It's white poster putty or white tack, it's sometimes called. And there are a bunch of different brands of this and I don't have any preference. And the second question is, where can I get some? And now you can get some on my website. And I have this Gorilla brand listed there. And this is pretty good stuff. I stuck this mic to my door about a week ago. And I use this door. And I'm pretty sure that this would just stay here indefinitely. And the third question is, does this putty affect the sound? And today I want to use data to try to answer that question. So I have this little plywood box. And I'm going to put some masking tape on it so that I can trace the outline of a microphone there. And that way I'll be able to get this microphone back in exactly the same spot each time. And then I'm going to put a little of this Scotch double-sided tape down and then I'll just stick the microphone to that. And then over here I'm going to put a little bit more double-sided tape down and I'm going to stick this piezo disc here. And I'm going to use this piezo disc as a speaker. And I've shown this setup before, but just to recap, the mic goes into the input of my audio interface, the speaker goes into the output of my audio interface, and the audio interface gets plugged into my computer, and I'm going to use this software that I wrote to generate white noise. So I'll press play there, and you can hear this piezo speaker hissing a little bit, and that's the white noise. And my microphone is picking that up, and I'm going to record about 17 seconds of that. And when that's done, my computer is going to plot this spectrum of the sound that came back. And this is what that looks like. So this is frequency on the x-axis and amplitude on the y-axis. And white noise has equal amplitude at all frequencies. So white noise by itself would just be a flat line. And because of that, we know that any peaks and valleys that we see in this plot had to have been introduced by my setup. Something in my setup has either amplified or attenuated different frequencies. And we don't know what part of my setup is responsible for which peaks and valleys. But at least we can use this as a baseline for making comparisons. And the first comparison I want to make, just as kind of a sanity check, I want to make sure that this experiment is repeatable. So without touching anything or moving or adjusting anything, I'm just going to hit play again here and repeat this exact experiment again. And this is the result of that. And here is the original baseline recording. And then here they are plotted together. And you can see that they really are identical. And that's not that surprising because nothing changed, but this at least shows us that the experiment is repeatable in that sense. And the other thing I want to do to test the repeatability is that I'm just going to unstick this microphone from the box and then stick it back down in the exact same place that I outlined before. And then I'll repeat the experiment. And this is the result. And this is that original baseline. And they're not identical, and that's a little bit surprising. Although it looks like kind of the broad shape is basically the same. It looks like both plots have these little notch filters in them. But the position of those notches are different in the different plots. And this is something that I've noticed many times before, that the presence and exact location of these notches is highly sensitive to the exact placement of the mic. And I've never really fully understood it, but at least this tells us that these notches aren't really the result of the presence or absence of putty. Anyway, so the next thing I'm going to do is take a little piece of this putty and spread it out very thinly across the bottom of this mic. And then I'll stick it back down in exactly the same place it was before. And I'll repeat my exact same experiment again. And so here's the result of that. And there's the baseline again. And again, you can see that they pretty well match up most places, except for these few notches. But I'd still like to know, are any of these notches due to the putty, or are they all just due to the fine positioning of the microphone? And so, of course, to test that, I'm just going to unstick the mic again and kind of stir everything up and then stick it right back down where it was. 
and repeat the experiment. And then here's the result of that. And then this is the other plot with the putty from just a second ago. And yeah, you can see all of the notches moved around again. So none of those notches are being filtered by the putty. And then here's that original baseline again. And I think it's safe to say that these plots are basically the same, at least up to the notches, and that the putty isn't really blocking out any meaningful amount of sound. But just to take this one step further, I'm gonna put this obnoxiously large blob of putty onto my contact microphone. And I'm gonna stick it back down in the exact same place again. And just so you can see, this is, I don't know, six or seven millimeters of putty. You'd never use this much. But again, I'm gonna repeat my experiment. And here's the result of that. And this is the original baseline again. And this one actually looks like maybe some of the higher frequencies are attenuated. So let's go back and unstick the mic again and stir it up again and stick it back down again in the same place and repeat the experiment again. And then here's the result of that. And this is the other plot from just a second ago with the big blob of putty. And then here again is the original baseline. And so yeah, this looks like this huge amount of putty is actually blocking out some of these higher frequency sounds. Although I will also draw your attention to the fact that I've used a very high sample rate. And what that means is that this whole region is completely outside of the range of human hearing. Nobody can hear frequencies this high. And so here's exactly the same data, but I've changed to a logarithmic frequency scale. And that really more accurately represents how you hear and perceive frequencies. And so here, the inaudible range has kind of been squished up all the way on the right-hand side of the graph. And within the audible frequency range, you can see these plots are actually very similar to one another. In fact, here are all of the plots that I've shown you in this video so far, all plotted together on a logarithmic frequency scale. And you can see that within the audible frequency range, they're all basically the same. They're all characterized by this U-shape, and that's because the box itself is probably absorbing frequencies in this 100 to 1000 hertz range. And the differences here are not significant. Even these initial two plots, which looked identical when I showed them to you before, they actually do deviate from one another slightly when you zoom in on the low frequencies like this. And that's just because there are fewer samples at this low frequency, so there's greater variance. And the differences you see between the plots in this range are really just because of the natural variance in the measurement. So this experiment pretty clearly demonstrates that this putty really is transparent to sound, at least within the audible frequency range. If you're using this in the ultrasonic frequency range, then you might have to worry about it. But as long as you're relatively parsimonious with the amount of putty that you use, it really shouldn't be an issue. So anyway, I hope that answers that question. And that's all I have to say about that for now. So as usual, thanks for watching. Like, subscribe, comment, etc. And I'll see you next time. Bye!